Hello. I am not sure if this is working yet. Hi, I think it's working. We are live. That is crazy. I have never done this before, so bear with me if I have any technical errors or such. I'm still like clicking buttons, figuring out whether I've done this correctly. Yeah, there's also like lag time um, at the moment I'm recording this not recording, but like going live here as well as like on YouTube. So, you know, like it took me some time to figure out that it is actually working. But hey, nice to see you. I can see your chats. It's working um, throughout this discussion. Uh, feel free to post your comments. Tell me what you thought about your paper. This is summer 2020. No, 2022. I'm not sure what I'm talking about. Paper 22! Yay! Now, the reason why I chose to you know, go YouTube Live on this is because, number one, this paper is not available yet online. Number two, um, well, a lot of people complained that it was a nightmare paper. It was very different compared to what they've seen in the past years. And, you know, there were nine different suggest and explain questions. And I, I just had to see it for myself and talk about it for myself. Now, Disclaimer, this is not actually a real unpacking, it means I have seen this paper before and uh, I flipped through it, I've tried it on my own, so I'm just now trying it in front of you guys and trying to share some of my thoughts. Um, for you, those who have not finished A-levels yet, um, I think paper, some of you are taking paper tree tomorrow, I think, and then some of you are taking paper tree on uh, in a few few weeks time, I think, yes, and most of you are taking paper one in mid June. Uh, where can you find this paper? Apparently nowhere. Um, only, only, uh, physical copies are available now. I see. I see some comments saying that the video is lagging. Okay, let me try and fix that in a moment by just shutting down some stuff. Hmm. Kind of sad that I'm lagging. Yep, so you said it. Okay, I hope it's better now. Uh, but I'm just going to continue and see what happens next. I'm not sure how to improve this any further. Anyways, yes. Um, how did I have access to this paper? Uh, it's because I am a full time teacher at an exam center, and after 24 hours of locking it inside a room, Literally, they will lock your papers in a room for 24 hours. After that, the papers are actually free for any, like any extra papers are free for anyone to collect. And uh, of course, there are only a few copies that are left over from the paper. And usually these goes to your school teachers if you are uh, at an exam center. Uh, can I please share this paper? Um, well, maybe. <laughs> I'm not sure how, but maybe. Now, anyway, um, some of you said that you felt like it was fine. Some of you said it was annoying. Feel free to share how you felt about this paper. I'm just going to go ahead and unpack it starting now. Sorry for the wasting of six minutes of time. Let's go. Let's look at question number one. Okay, there are six questions in total. There are 60 marks. So question number one here. Uh, let's look at it. Uh, they say that these are epithelial cells in a small intestine. I bet. 
and they have cell structures known as microvilli. And these cells borders the gut lumen, so basically intestinal epithelial cells. Great. So that's what they want to want us to know. That's microvilli and epithelial cells in the small intestine. Got you. Next. They tell you that this is uh, at a different magnification. One is from a scanning electron microscope and one from a transmission electron microscope. And this question is actually quite easy and quite typical of past years, I think. Uh, how, say, how is it possible to distinguish between a scanning and transmission electron micrograph? Now, I think... Um, they're, they're not very clear here, but actually they have hinted you the um, these pictures, you know, they actually said it in order that this is A, a scanning electron microscope and transmission electron microscope. So you shouldn't be too confused there. They didn't try to mix that up to confuse you. They just want you to know, just want, you, want to ask you how to distinguish these two. So the common mark scheme points would be, hey, number one, it is, well, a scanning electron microscope would have a 3D appearance. And as you can see it in this photo taken by a scanning electron micrograph, it's 3D. It is only the surface contours that are seen, not the internal structures that you can see via a transmission electron micrograph. Now, um, I think those are the accepted points and the main points of this. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I think it would be safe though if you have written about both sides. Now, by the way, I forgot to do this just now, but if this gives you anxiety, if this gives you like, you know, anxiety about how well you did please stop watching this video like don't go watch this video this is just what people want to revise and just like curious about how the paper went okay uh, do i have the marking scheme no i don't i don't have this marking scheme um this is this is just guesswork so just saying this from experience from past years um these are all just guessing answers so if you have any answers that you are um more in doubt of and you have many ideas about please feel free to put them in chat if i read it then i would i would answer i would i would add that into my answer as well okay anyways this is scanning electro microscope 3d survey next oh i'm sorry i accidentally erased that next the approximate length of a microvillus is one micrometer outline the method you will use to estimate the magnifications of the images shown in figure 1.1 so these are two of the images okay so they want you to be able to figure out how much is the magnification based on this assumption right that it's about one micrometer length now actually when they tell you this they are actually telling you the mean image length right of the mic no not image my bad the mean actual length of a microvilli microvillus and therefore you just have to manually be able to measure this in mm convert it and then divide it by one micrometer to find the magnification. So yeah, uh, how would I write this answer? Again, these are all guesswork, okay? I don't know the mark scheme. I'm just saying based on experience, okay? So number one, I would say number one would be measure the length of the microvilli and on the image, microvilli, on image possibly in um, mm i don't think mm would be required of you but i would write it just in case so this is the image length number two i would say to to take multiple because this is the approximate length and most likely the mean length possibly the mean length 
So I would say I take multiple measurements of this. So under the same step, take uh, take like minimum five measurements. Minimum five repeats are usually quite standard. And take a mean. Possible, again, possible mark point. So that's the I, that's the repeat. Uh, probably you want to talk about conversion. It needs to be the same converge. So if you measure in mm, convert mm to micrometer by multiplying 1000. I actually have not seen this question in the past years before, but I have seen this kind of um, steps written in MCQ. So in paper one, sometimes this occur. Then I will explain that magnification is the division of the image you calculated just now, divided by actual which is one micrometer. This image. So the magnification would really uh, be times the image. Okay, so write that all in a sentence in whatever way it should be, then it should be fine. So yeah, I think this is kind of the question. Let's go to the next one. Now, the next one is something new, uh, which is what would scare students if you are you know, if you didn't expect seed coming, don't worry, just, just brief. They tend to scare you with these things. Just brief and read what the information is giving you. Okay, they, tell you, they are telling you that one of the roles of the intestinal epithelial cell is the absorption of glucose from the gut lumen, which makes sense because it's at the intestine. So it's involved in absorption of glucose from the food into your body. So that makes sense, right? And these are some events that are occurring in the intestinal epithelial cell. This is drawn not to scale. And even though you're very tempted to count the circles and diamonds and whatnot, I've counted it and it doesn't line up. So it doesn't mean anything. You know, the quantities are not real. It's not to scale after all, okay? Now let's read the information they give us below. Very important to read what they give us. Right, sodium ions are removed from the cell by active transport through a transport protein known as a sodium potassium pump. So they are telling you that, okay, this is probably step one, right? And step one is happening right here through the sodium potassium pump. And this is an active transport process. Right, and the consequence of this is that this decreases the concentration of sodium ions in the cell compared to the gut lumen. So, okay, that makes sense because it's active transport and it's against the concentration gradient. And you can see here, uh, sodium is moving out and potassium is moving in. Honestly, we have learned this sodium potassium pump before and the common, you know, direction is three na, sorry, three na out, two K in. Right. So we actually know exactly how many molecules of, uh, how many ions of sodium are getting out, how many are moving back in, uh, how many potassium is coming back in. Anyways, number two says that this would reduce the concentration of sodium inside the cell. And I'm just going to write that here. This is number two. Number three, number three says glucose molecules are then co-transported with sodium ions into a cell from the gut lumen. And it's telling this is from the gut lumen, so this is happening right here. Because of the decrease in sodium ions here, you can verify that this is facilitated diffusion. Now, even though you have never seen this picture before, this co-transporter thing should ring a bell in your head. It sounds like the something that happens in the uh, flow in translocation in loading of sucrose into the sieve tube in those in 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 that situation right it also functions something like this but not quite because in the flow of sieve tube you are talking about the hydrogen ion sucrose 
coal transporter. But the concepts are the same. The concepts are the same. It's not the same, but it should ring a bell. Concept is the same though. Number four, glucose molecules are then transported out of the cell into the tissue fluid down a concentration gradient. And that happens here on the diagram. And this is also facilitated diffusion. How do we know? Well, it says down the concentration gradient. So it must be facilitated diffusion. All right. So with this knowledge, let's look at the question. The question says, active transport involves water-soluble substances and the use of ATP to provide energy needed to transport yeah, transport through carrier proteins. So they actually told you three things. Right? Number one is water-soluble substances. Number two uses ATP. Number three, it is use, it is um it requires carrier proteins. They are asking whether there are other features of active transport. This is the trippy part. Yes, I see your comments. Um, yeah, this is not accepted. So if you write anything about ATP, carrier proteins, and water-soluble substances, you may not be able to get the mark. What may score a mark is if you have said something like against concentration gradient active transport is transporting substances against a concentrated gradient or uh, in other words from a low to high concentration these two points are usually the same mark point so that would be one mark most likely Maybe, and this is like kind of pushing it, but maybe uh, they would also be okay if you said that this happens through uh, across a partially permeable membrane. Because we only learn active transport in the context of membrane transport, so not like happening outside the context of cell. So this could be a mark point as well. And okay, this is again another type pushing it. Now, they said water-soluble substances, but they didn't quite say ions or um, larger molecules. So maybe, maybe, maybe. Again, this is a guess. I don't have the mark scheme, okay? I'm just guessing, right? So maybe saying ions or larger molecules, right? would score you a mark again really pushing it here is two marks they usually would have more points than two i'm just guessing you know what kind of things would we be able to see another desperate you know point here or two since most are of it are in the question already would most likely be like specific it's most likely a specific transport Okay, carrier proteins are shaped in a specific manner to allow only specific, you know, um, substances to be transported actively using that particular carrier protein. So it is specific. Just writing that it is carrier proteins are specific, full stop, would mean what I just said just now. I can't think of any other points um, here. I'm really squeezing my brain for this because they say outline other features of acting transport. So if you had said anything, um, yeah, related to this or you have any other thoughts about this question, please put them in the chat. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, if you wrote ATP, I don't think that is part of the... Um, question oh yeah i was napping and i thought this could be a point as well and i think some of you said it in the chat as well and you said uh it undergoes confirmation change i think that would be possible possible the atp is for carrier proteins to undergo confirmation of change sounds very possible my point as well possibly stronger than these two points above.
Yeah. Okay, so moving on to the next question. That's only the first question, guys. We're not even at the end of the first question. This is a roller coaster. <clears throat> Glucose molecules can enter the cell, enter the cell through a membrane protein. Why does it need to be co-transported with sodium ion when it enters the cell through the membrane protein? Well, this is where your knowledge about um, the translocation, the loading of sucrose into a sieve tube, you know, this would come in handy. Again, you don't really need to know, remember it, right? It's not directly related to this question, but the conceptual knowledge is the same. Yeah. So, so, um, I would write something like, again, I've never seen this in the past year before, uh, but I would write something like sodium ion um, drives the transport. So the sodium ions are transported down the concentration gradient. I'm sorry if my writing is terrible. Tell me if you can't read it, okay? And glucose is tran being transported against the concentration gradient. So really explaining what's going on here. And the movement of sodium is actually driving the transport. So um, a fancy word would be influx. So movement inwards of sodium ion is driving, drives the transport of glucose. Um, I'm not sure the exact phrasing they would require, but the proper term that is seen in some mark schemes, not all, and also seen in some of my slides, uh, is this term called secondary active transport. So this actually uses uh, secondary active transport. So it is active transport for glucose, which is against the concentration and doesn't require ATP. Those are my points I can think of when this when I read this question. Can I make the pen a bit thicker? Okay, okay, sure, sure, sorry. I'm just scribbling, aren't I? I'll try to zoom in a little bit more too. Maybe it'll make my writing nicer. Hmm. Next, explain how microvilli increase the uptake of glucose into an intestinal epithelial cell. Okay, this is kind of easy. Uh, basically, um, uptake of glucose is through proteins, right? Through facet diffusion, active transport, more facet diffusion, right? So basically, there is more surface area. Oh, making it higher really does. Making it thicker really does improve my handwriting. Therefore, higher surface area, more number of proteins, carrier or channel proteins can be used, can be placed at the cell membrane, and therefore, higher rate of diffusion this one doesn't have marks okay the mark probably only goes to this too i cannot think of anything else okay reading some of the chat points uh, if you wrote something about estimates is that correct i'm sorry but this has nothing to do with it's the same concept but has nothing to do with assimilates uh, how about the ATPase enzyme? Uh, I don't think ATPase enzyme um, is is that because it's ATP related, so it's not technically, you know, other features of active transport. But maybe, maybe, who knows? Like saying that a carrier protein also acts as ATPase which breaks down ATP to ADP. I personally didn't teach that in class or through my videos that much uh, because that ATPase term is very much an A2 term. Um, I feel conformational change is related to how the carrier specific, no? Well, um, 
not exactly right sometimes there is binding that is specific but conformational change is what makes it require atp so i think those points are slightly different what if we write something like it's since it's a core transporter more than one substance needs to be transported that's why glucose goes and this will it be correct hmm i don't know i don't know i i i don't think so because they're not ask it's not big i mean i think the question is asking why is there a cold transporter why can't it be transported on its own right and that's not because of the name um and that wouldn't be explaining at all answering the question correct so yeah um do you think you get two marks for saying more surface area and more surface area to volume ratio i don't think so um i realize that surface area to volume ratio only comes into play when they're talking about diffusion to the center of the cell or it's an agar experiment a surface area to volume ratio doesn't often quite come up when it talks up when we are talking about facilitated diffusion and active transport. Okay, moving on. Stem cells. Stem cells are located in the wall of the S1 intestines. These cells divide by mitosis continuously. Suggest and explain the importance of mitosis by stem cells in S1 intestines. And basically, the same thing applies to all stem cells, right? Um, basically, the first point should always be, um, right, they can divide continuously, which is in the question. Okay, and it can self renew as in it can divide into one cell, one stem cell, which replaces the original one stem cell and divide into uh, another cell that can differentiate. Actually, I wrote the mark points weird here. Usually, this is one mark, and then this is another mark. So, my bad. A mark here. Possibly one mark here. All right, and what is this important for? So, suggest and explain why. All right. So, this will be important for cell replacement. And this is actually the same as tissue repair. This is especially important in the gut tissue uh, where it's exposed to more environmental elements and therefore easily damaged. So cell replacement and tissue repair is very important here. Um, what else? Growth, yeah. Growth would be applicable here as well although i guess this one doesn't just grow as you grow to a certain extent i think i don't know four marks one two three four surely there's more right surely there is more i wrote about telomerase as well just because i really don't know what else to put in here suggest and explain so so this is what why is important so this is the importance this is why these these thing stem cells are good for this thing so i assume that features of the stem cells are accepted as well so even though they said divide by mitosis continuously i probably add that hey uh, it has telomerase somewhere in the quick answer right and this is what causes it to be able to divide continuously can we say produce cells that can specialize and differentiate? Yeah, yeah, why not? Yeah. All right, and it's four marks. That's all the points I can think of. Tell me if you have any more. Ooh, I saw one um, by Banin, I think, uh, for this question here on the top. 
and says that can we just say that glucose molecules are polar so they cannot move through the hydrogen bubble into the cell and yeah you can write that i think yeah this here glucose is polar it's polar yes they are water soluble not technically polar and um and they are very large so they cannot pass through the phospholipid bilayer on their own yes and that is all of question one again these are all guesses and again if this makes you anxious please stop watching it's fine i i'm doing this for fun this yeah stop watching again these are again guesses of the mark scheme these are what my answers would be and i may not be 100 percent correct okay so don't 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 rely on me for it next question cholera life-threatening and infectious disease caused by the bacterium vibrio cholerae one of the symptoms of the disease is severe diarrhea they tell you that there are two forms of the pathogens o1 and o39 o139 that are associated with cholera epidemics and there these two forms have different antigens that can be detected cool same pathogen two strains i mean we live through a pandem pandemic the delta strain the um micron strain i think we by now know what strains are right okay right now they say that if an outbreak of cholera is suspected but not confirmed send at home treatment is to immediately prevent severe illness as a result of dehydration if the cholera is the cause of the disease this standard treatment also prevents a larger outbreak of the disease what is this standard treatment that can prevent severe illness as a result of dehydration so the answer here will always be ors using oral rehydration salts this is a mixture of salts and uh sugar of some form and water and these are isotonic all right sorry you don't learn the word isotonic same water potential with your blood all right and this helps less dehydration to occur um i don't think vaccines are allowed here um the vaccines are not treatment they are prevention methods another thing another treatment that i can think of is antibiotics but these are not recommended forms of treatment and it doesn't prevent severe illness as a result of dehydration so i think they really 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 want ors here um i don't think clean water is a standard treatment as well uh, because it doesn't exactly prevent further dehydration uh, or as well now suggest and explain why this treatment can help to prevent a larger outbreak of cholera now this is the point where i'm like what what are you talking about right it's ors like it's a treatment how can it be a prevention as well so how can this treatment be a form of prevention as well and the only thing that comes to mind is that okay if more people are treated all right that means the higher the faster uh, the faster and more people would recover so higher recovery rate and the higher the recovery rate means less likely to spread uh the cholera toxin or cholera spread um i think transmit might be a better term here the bacterium true feces you need to tell them that you know and you've studied cholera right so you want to insert your knowledge where it is possible so less likely to transmit bacterium through feces and maybe uh this would allow um a, like it would decrease yeah so it can transmit less right so lesser larger outbreak i don't know i'm just guessing another possibility as well 
could be because it's ORS, right? It's not really combating the bacteria per se. It's really uh, just helping with the dehydration. So maybe, maybe, again, I don't know, just guessing. Maybe this allows the body to fight the cholera itself and build some form of active natural immunity towards the pathogen. So maybe this would help the person from further infection and possibly also contribute towards herd immunity. So acting like some sort of vaccine, but not because this is natural. I don't know. I don't know. At this point, I'm like, I'm just going to try. If I were you, I would just try. Just write. Just fill up all the lines with something kind of kind of there oh uh, i think if you didn't recall rrs terms specifically you might not get the rs mark but because you have described what the rrs is i think you'll still get the mark so if you have talked about salt sugar water yeah replacing loss water yeah sure I think that would give you the mark as well. All right, next question, which would be crazy. Looks like this. Okay, so we don't learn this in so much detail, uh, but they, they are actually wanting you to figure it out from context as well. So I think personally, I taught this in class, in my live class, uh, through a video about pregnancy testing i've also sent my students like my personal students uh, videos on covid 19 testing which is basically a dip some form of dipstick test right but instead of dipstick like urine urine is a dipstick test uh, and for covid is like a, a saliva test but anyways it works quite similarly uh, they are telling you that this has mobile and immobilized monoclonal antibody. So this is a monoclonal antibody question from chapter 11. And this can distinguish between O1 and O139 strains. Uh, you can get a fecal sample and you add a re reagent solution, some form of buffer as you do with COVID-19 test kits. And then you dip this area into the test mixture. And they tell you more stuff, right? They tell you that the mixture moves up the dipstick through area one, and these are mobile monoclonal antibodies. So if you have O1, then that is going to bind to the NTO1 antibody. So NTO1 means it binds to O1. NTO19, O139 antibody will bind to O139. And if this this uh antigens are bound to these antibodies it will flow to test area two or three where uh the color would appear so if there is binding of nto1 antibody plus o1 basically the antigen antibody complex o1 is going to show up here as a band and and then if O139 binds to NTO139 antibody, it will form a complex. And this test area would bind that complex and form the line. So basically, this is for O1, this is for O139. This is not visible. This is a control area, and if you have done any COVID-19 test kits, this confirms that the test strip is working, they tell you, and the results are valid. So this is going to be always there. What is the question? Okay, before you panic, always read your question. Explain how the structure of the monoclonal antibodies in dipstick allows them to be specific in the action. So monoclonal antibodies are um, and basically antibodies. So you should be describing how they are made out of 
uh, two light chains and two heavy chains and uh, some parts of the heavy chain and the light chains actually form a variable region and the variable region has a specific sequence of amino acids. It is after all a protein which makes it specific. Specific is a specific word. It means a lot. Now this will allow the shape of the variable region to be complementary in shape to the corresponding antigen. And therefore, this enables enables it to bind to different complexes or antigens of different strains. So this is not really a mark point, so sorry, I suppose. Mm. Well, it allows them to be specific. I think, maybe, maybe. I'm just going to write it just in case. You know, if I were you, I would have just written it. Combination shit engine so it can buy engine total. Whew. So yeah, uh, th that would be my answer again. Um, monoclonal antibodies is pretty much the same as normal antibodies. So you're really just describing the structure of antibodies. Um, and they only want to hear about things that are concerning the specificity so although it's very tempting to write about the constant region and the disulfide bonds and the hinge region perhaps this is not relevant to the question and uh, from experience those points don't usually count as marks um i i'm reading the chat now and i realized that a lot of you wrote antibiotics uh, but antibiotics do not prevent dehydration so i don't think antibiotics may score a mark but if you've written if you have written it no no harm done it's not gonna they're not gonna mark Reiner's mark just because you wrote about antibiotics okay so yeah let's look at the next question um and this shows you two different um samples and although at first glance this seems pretty hard because it asks you to refer to the figure, say, explain the conclusions that we drawn. Actually, all they want is that this person is positive and this line here is for O1, not O139, and that this person is negative and the test is valid. So state and explain. So stating will probably have one mark, explaining would probably have another. So for person A, I would say that it's too bad, uh, it, to explain the results. So band 3 and 4 are present and therefore this tells us that O1 strain is antigens are present so this person has cholera is positive for cholera. Now I'm not sure what, how they're going to split the marks exactly but if you write all those points there I think you would have gotten it so this one only the control band is present this means the person does not have cholera the person is negative for cholera and I think that's it <laughs> I don't think they want anything else um from you you have just you have stated the results and you have explained it by referencing the figure Yeah, and that's it. Next question. This question was a bit confusing because of the phrasing. It tells you that, okay, this is the investigation to evaluate effectiveness, right? There are samples taken from one, five, six people in total. Uh, and they want you to calculate the percentage chance of an RGT dipstick correctly confirming that a person with cholera has the disease. So correctly 
confirming person with cholera has a disease. Do not overthink this. This is only one mark that should give you a sign not to overthink this. Not like I did. So most likely it's just this number divided by this number. Because this is people who are positive. This is how many that had the correct diagnosis. So it's like 7 over 102 times 100. And do that and you should get 90 something percent. Which is pretty good. Yay. Using an RDT dipstick to diagnose cholera is much cheaper. So they already tell you it's cheaper. It already tells you that it causes, requires less technical skill. One additional advantage. Suggest that. So talk about how fast it is. It's fast. It's faster. It's, it's quicker. You can do this at home. It can be mass produced. Uh, I think there is a range of points that can be um, accepted here, but faster would be the most straightforward one. Can you say that both the dipsticks are working fine? Yeah, you can. Why not? I've already kind of said that, uh, but if you write that as a separate point, that would be fine as well. Next question. Oh my gosh, it's only question number two. Let's look at question number three. Question number three is about hummingbirds and they tell you that they have a high requirement of sugars and have a very high metabolic rate. Um, it tells you the lifestyle of hummingbirds traveling hundreds of kilometers. Um, and what's the question? The question just goes like, hey, tell us. What is the difference between sucrose and fructose? Kind of far-fetched related to um, nectar hummingbirds relates to nectar which relates to sugars okay it's Cambridge whatever you say so tell me two differences despite all right other than the number of carbon hydrogen and oxygen atoms present yeah so this is kind of easy I think it's disaccharide versus monosaccharides um, write that properly so um, what else? Um, one is a non-reducing sugar. It didn't say structure only. It just says differences in general. So I think non-reducing versus reducing sugar would be accepted here. Um, uh, even maybe presence of glycosidic bonds. So sucrose has glycosidic bonds versus no glycosidic bonds versus none. Um, and and uh, I cannot think of many, anything else, and this was a very desperate attempt. And I wrote that sucrose is made by condensation of fructose and glucose, whereas fructose is a product of hydrogen. I think it's a bad point, so I'm not going to write it down. It's a bad point. It's kind of far-fetched. This is the most straightforward, most apparent ones. Um, ooh! Some, so you said this was the easiest, right? Uh, and and I, I see Aya saying that sucrose can only exist in ring form and glucose can, can, you mean fructose? Fructose can be in linear or ring form. No, I, yeah, yeah, made of two rings. Two rings versus either ring or linear. Yeah, why not? I've never thought of that. Thank you. I I did not think of that at all. I hope it's accepted. I feel like it would. Well done. That's it. Let's move on. Next question. Also very easy. Also kind of far-fetched from the original hummingbird question. Uh, but it talked about triglyceride. And they tell you that this is palmitate, this oleate, and this, this, this is the structure here. Outline the features. Easy. So just talk about the features, talk about how triglycerides are look like look alike. So one glycerol is it and three fatty acids. And uh, it's made by a condensation reaction between all of these and therefore a removal of three three 
water molecules. It, well, that's a bit far-fetched. So I'm not going to write that. I think the main point would be based on the figure. So possibly three ester bonds are present. If you're wondering where the ester bonds are, they are right here. C O C double O here. These are the ester bonds. And then go on and talk about the three fatty acids. Well, two types. So palmitate, talk about palmitate first. This is a saturated fatty acid. And it's actually shorter. Is it shorter actually? Hmm, let me see. Yes. Says it's shorter and uh, oleate is uh, there are two of them times two. These are unsaturated again, not sure how the marks are going to be allocated. All guesswork here, all guesswork. Unsaturated, they are longer. Um, I guess. This would be all the mark points because you just want to talk about the molecular structure. The structure. So I won't go and talk further about the, the features of the function of, of maybe even of the, the temperature, melting temperature that much. Um, yeah, none of that. No fluidity here. Just very straightforward molecular structure oh oh um because it's unsaturated it has double bonds which has kinks yeah i would write that yeah i think that's it Let me take a water break. Water break. Drink some water, guys. I'm reading the chat and I'm reading your question, your your comment, your chats about like the different question that I answered just now. Again, there's a lag between live me talking and chat, so I have to always go back. I don't know what would be all right and not all right, honestly, because. Again, I'm just guessing the mark scheme. Um, some of you said, one of you said, uh, what if I, what if I said sucrose or polysaccharide? Well, no, it's not a polysaccharide. Fructose is a monomer of sucrose? Maybe. Um, what if I talked about, like, linkages and glycosic bonds? I, don't, I think they would ignore that because you don't really learn what type of linkage is present between glucose and fructose in sucrose that much. So, yeah, I, I, I don't think... So, sucrose has more hydroxyl groups than fructose. Um, maybe, but I don't think that's a very strong point. Not a very straightforward point. Um, if I just I didn't mention the word oleate or palmitate, I just say unsaturated or saturated. Would it be all right? I don't know. I don't know, but I hope so. Yeah, I I don't see a problem with that at all. Let's move on. Let's move on. So, hummingbirds. Glycogen is a long-term carbohydrate energy store. Suggests one reason why hummingbird builds up a greater energy store in the form of triglyceride than in glycogen. Why fat instead of polysaccharide? Okay, this is a typical, typical pass your question, actually. Because fats have a higher ratio of carbon to hydrogen bonds and are able to store more energy per unit mass. So it's lighter, but it has a very it's hot, it's energy rich, rich. Next question. See the term used to describe this type of circulatory system. Blood is kept in a vessel that means close and passes through the heart twice. So this is close double circulatory system. You, this is usually asked in the opposite way, they ask you to define, but now they're giving you the definition instead of um, asking you for well, definition, is asking you to name the term. Next question suggests why 
the heart of birds is larger in proportion to their body size compared to mammals. Why? Now, based on all the information they gave you about hummingbirds, which are amazing creatures, by the way, I follow like some hummingbird accounts on Instagram and they are fascinating. Anyways, the main point is that, well, birds fly for flying. They fly great distances. So very far, very energy consuming here. And therefore, there's a higher energy requirement uh, for metabolism. So therefore, higher oxygen and glucose and glucose needed in order to supply the cells with the energy they require in order for respiration, high metabolism, respiration. What is respiration for, right? Respiration is to make more ATP and therefore more metabolism can result. Yeah. Why are we doing paper two? I have already given it up. Or I've already passed it up. Why? I don't know. I don't know why you guys are here. Why are you guys here? Why do you want to know the answers again? Why do you keep asking me? I don't understand. Uh, for me, it's just revision. For me, it's just fun to see um, the answers come out. And to see someone just dissect it, I suppose. That's why I thought could be fun to just have a YouTube life. Why are you here? If it makes you anxious, stop watching. Again, these are all just guesses of the math scheme. This is my answer for this question. This question, I think, is the truly the easiest question. It's just fill in the table with the correct main blood vessels associated with the heart. So these are the four. Yeah. Pretty sure this is correct. Not discussing this. Moving on. Question number four. Four. We are halfway through the paper. Halfway through the paper. We can do this. This is the question that I got the most questions about. Carbonic anhydrase. It has found in a wide range of organisms. Acts as a catalyst in many tissues. Okay. And they're saying that there are differences in protein structure of the enzyme. Differences in number of organization of introns and axons. Okay, this is new to the syllabus. So, um, it's this is brand new to my eyes as well. Can't base this on past years that I know about. Can only base this on knowledge I know about introns and axons. Anyways, they give you the, the equation and ask you to name X and Y. Easy. X is carbonic acid. And why is hydrogen carbonate ion? This is kind of rare that they ask you the full name of these uh, chemical chemicals. Um, usually, they don't mind if you use them interchangeably. So if you memorize it, good job. Next, carbonic anhydrase enzymes can have different primary structures. Suggest how all carbonic anhydrase enzymes can catalyze the same reaction even though they have different primary structures. Okay, read the question carefully. Um, they say that differences in protein structure of enzyme and differences in intron axons, therefore different primary structures. That makes sense because they're different genes, different types, therefore different primary structures, but same reaction, same substrate. Why is that? same substrate same reaction because it has it doesn't matter if they have different primary structures as long as their active site is similar right so that it is complementary in shape with the substrates and this would allow it to be able to carry out reaction. Next question. 
genes coding for proteins in eukaryotes consists of introns and exons. I'll learn the similarities and differences between the introns and exons of genes coding for proteins such as carbonic anhydrase. So again, this is a new to, new to a syllabus kind of question. So uh, there, are, this is this is brand new. Okay, so I'm just going on based on my my knowledge. Right, they want similarities and differences. So let's do similarities first. So similarities, they are both made out of DNA, both made out of DNA, both DNA based sequences. They are both transcribed, right, into pre RNA, at least. Right, and that's pretty much all the similarities I have in mind. How about differences? Differences between introns and exons. One is non-coding. Introns are non-coding. Uh, exons are coding sequences. And this means that uh, the intron is not translated, whereas the exons are translated. Um, I wrote that the introns are spliced out. Means they're cut out of the pre-RNA. And the axons are joined together and this is during the RNA processing. So yeah, that's what my um, answer would look like. Again, so far, even though the question is slightly new to the eyes, it is not that bad. It is not that bad. It could be bad. Both single-stranded. No. Um, introns and exons are genes, are part of the gene. They are DNAs. So they're both DNA, double-stranded. Yay. How about surface area to volume ratio about the hummingbird question? Um, I don't think that is the case because if you're talking about surface area to volume ratio, uh, then mammals should have a bigger heart. But now it's the opposite, right? Birds have a larger proportion. Heart of birds are larger in spite of its heart lower surface area to volume ratio. Wait. Oh, if you're talking about, huh? Hmm. I guess. Hmm. But no, that's not the question. The question's the question's asking. Uh, we we all know, right? The question assumes that the heart is for transport of all these nutrients. They are asking about the size. Why is the size larger in proportion to body size? But to understand that surface area to volume ratio about transport systems is is because of the capillaries and the blood vessels not because of the heart versus body size so surface area to bone ratio probably not okay sorry back um how about induced shape induced fit for carbonic anhydrase enzymes I, I guess um you can write that you can say you can say that the active site is flexible and induced fit i feel like that could be um uh, acceptable mark point as well yeah well done. Active site same is not exactly the same as similar. Mm. I, I guess same and similar here is pretty much okay. Uh, I think the main point here though is complementary in shape with the substrate. Because it could be have a slightly different active site, but um what matters is that it's complementary in shape with the substrate. Is altitude correct in this? Ooh. But altitude is not in the syllabus anymore. It wouldn't be fair. I don't think so. Hummingbirds also exist around the same altitude. They don't fly as high. I think. I need to check that. <laughs> Someone check. Hummingbirds. What altitude do they exist in? And uh, what altitude can they re reach? Uh, from they they feed on flowers and flowers on the ground right you should be quite close to ground as well anyway let's look at the next question isoforms 
So there are 15 isoforms of alpha carbonic anhydrase in humans. Cells of different tissues have one or more isoforms. Within the cells, the isoforms may be in different locations. Okay, so different tissues. So not just ribbit cells, but maybe like muscle cells or liver cells. Or I don't know. Different tissue. I'm just naming tissues here. But riblet cells have two isoforms, CA1 and CA2, suggest the location. This tripped a lot of my students up. Um, I think some of you were commenting on how hard this was as well. Uh, but I think the answer is quite straightforward. I think the answer is cytoplasm. Why cytoplasm? It says suggest location and give a reason. So just one mark name, number two, give a reason. Well, because the substrates are there, substrates that are CO2 and H2O are present in the cytoplasm. Uh, we can also say that hemoglobin, which is uh, in charge of being a buffer, can bind to hydrogen ions that is a side product of the reaction. Uh, and this is why CA1 and CA2 exist in the cytoplasm. Hemoglobin, which is a lot of, some of you wrote that location is at the hemoglobin itself. Uh, unfortunately, hemoglobin is a protein. It's not technically a location in the cell. Um, it's and CA1 and CA2 are proteins as well. So how can be a protein inside be inside another protein? I don't think so. So cytoplasm would be my go-to answer here. But if you wrote about hemoglobin, I think you should have scored one mark at least for the explanation. Isoform CA6 from part of human breast milk. Um, they say that it packages this in the this is this package in the Golgi vesicles and released from cells. Name the transport mechanism associated with this. Well, I think this is quite straightforward. This is exocytosis, not endoexo, because it says release from the cells. So it's going out. Next question. Can it be cell membrane? No. This reaction happens in the cytoplasm. Next question. Human CA isoforms in some epithelial cells in the eye have a role in the formation of clear fluid known as aqueous humor. Okay, whatever, whatever, whatever. You can read that on your own. Uh, I don't want to make this too long, so let's go. Describe the mechanism of action of acetylzolamide as a reversible you usually learn irreversible so it's quite unusual but pretty much the same thing a reversible non competitive inhibitor of carbonic anhydrase so describe a non competitive inhibitor talk about how it binds to the allosteric site which is not the active site of the enzyme Right, everything you know about non carbonic inhibitor goes into here. Uh, after it binds, it can change the shape of active site. You will realize in a lot of enzyme questions, they always mention the word active site. Um, therefore, substrate cannot bind, and therefore, enzyme substrate complex, which is always a mark point, does not form, and therefore, lower rate of reaction is reversible so I suppose it can detach and reattach uh, therefore the rate of reaction wouldn't be zero it might still be there it's just um, but it helps reduce the rate of reaction anyway and can be used as a drug in the treatment of glaucoma that's it. There's a lot of points for three marks. Again, easy question. I missed the hard ones. Moving on. The more I do this question, the more I think it is not that difficult. Not that difficult. Ooh, wrote near cell membrane. If you wrote cytoplasm near the cell membrane for this question, okay, 
Um, if you wrote location and then state reason, will I get a mark? Most likely, you probably get a mark for cytoplasm anyway, but not one for explanation. I wrote it would be out of hemoglobin in cytoplasm. I'm not sure about surface for faster reaction. Yeah. Again, if you think that you are nervous and anxious because of this discussion, please stop watching. Make good boundaries for yourself. I am discussing this because people have requested, and I think it's good revision. It's just a good thought experiment. Um, there will be no tips just saying, I don't know what's going to come up for paper one. But by looking at the questions, we can figure out, you know, what kind of things has come out, came out and what kind of things may be, may appear in paper one instead. Um, anyways, yeah, no predictions here. Just saying that, you know, maybe it will balance out. Maybe if this is hard, paper one will be easier. Maybe, maybe. <sighs> okay, let's go on. Question number five, second last question here, guys. Bear with me. So this is a transverse section to a bronchus. So there's a hint there. This is a bronchus. The bronchus has cartilage, plates, trachea, bronchus, then bronchioles, then alveoli, right? So the bronchus has cartilage plates, just saying. Now, um, A, A says that the luminal surface shown in figure 5.1 is not clearly defined and appears slightly blurred. Why? Why does it appear slightly blurred? Now, again, this is a bronchus, and that should give you a very good indication that it is these cells that we're looking at surface are ciliated epithelial cells. So because they are ciliated and cilia is tiny, this is why um, it may not be, it can be it can be seen as separate from the background, but it would have a slightly blur appearance. This is cilia, and this is because cilia is very small. Therefore, can't see. Next, can't see clearly. Some cells of bronchial epithelium shown in figure 5.1 appear darker than others. Okay, the epithelial layer. Why? Why some appear darker? Why some appear like that? Again, bronchus. Think of what's happening at the epithelium layer of the bronchus. There are ciliated epithelium cells. And within the layer, there are also globet cells. Globet cells are probably cell D. They probably appear darker because they produce some form of mucus. Oops, I misspelled it. And therefore, um, those the mucus may be, you know, seen as darker under the microscope. Moving on. C, right? Thank the Lord. They told you that tissue in box B is cartilage. Yay! Box B is tiny. Look at this. I'm like zooming in. This is like, this is tiny. These are chondrocytes and like paired, paired polka dots, right? Paired cells in the cartilage. That's crazy. They asked to identify that. I was worried at it for a moment. Then my, my wonderful colleague, actually pointed out, hey, they actually told them it's cartilage. Yay! Now they just have to determine what cell, what tissue A is. And tissue A, here, you can see the elongated uh, nuclei and the layered appearance. This here is smooth muscle. I think I mentioned in my videos that it kind of looks like layers of toilet paper. It kind of is structured that way. Layers and layers of cell. Now, what is the question? Question says, outline the differences in structure and function. That's why it's three marks, right? They want you to talk about structure and function. Uh, so basically, box A is smooth muscle, and box B is cartilage. So smooth muscle actually has smaller cells compared to the cartilage. I'm just going to write smaller versus bigger cells, right? Um, I would say that 
there are layers the cells are arranged in layers you know they are elongated right but whereas in uh the cartilage um the cells are kind of grouped together uh, actually even paired together in some in in many situations there are paired nuclei the nuclei is round um yeah that's all the 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 structures i can think of how about the function because they say it's structure and function right so what are the differences in function so maybe contract right smooth muscles can contract or relax whereas cartilage can't they are just there for structural support so i think the functions one i'm not sure how the marks will be allocated but this is what i'm writing it as it can contract and relax the tissue b obviously can't because it's structural support now the contraction and relaxation of your move smooth muscle will result in constriction or dilation of the of the airway some form of constraint uh, if but obviously that doesn't actually um, happen in the bronchus it happens more in the bronchial where there is no cartilage at all uh, but i'm just going to write it because it just says tissue a compared to tissue b it didn't say where so m most likely it would be still accepted and for structural support uh, this is to prevent collapse so this is the effect of that rigidness this rigid strong structural support the cartilage will be able to provide what if you say it's a submucosal layer it's not i'm sorry uh what if what if you wrote um lower magnification or or lower resolution unfortunately it says here the resolution of image is good so you can't talk about resolution um magnification probably wouldn't help because it's resolution that matters here about clarity um miss for this i wrote carbon hydrous is found in the cytoplasm oh that's the previous question yeah i I think that is quite similar to what I wrote as well. Thank you, someone, for saying yes, you can. Yeah. This is a very big chapter 9 question, by the way. This is question number 5. It's a total of 6 marks, but I've not seen like a question that is so comprehensive on all the different parts of, of, of the area before. And that brings us to our last question. Question number six, which is the, which has one tough question and the easiest. So let's solve the easiest one first. So the easiest one is about features of the flow and tissue. And um, the answers here are sleeve plate, periphery of the cells, because peripheral cytoplasm exists, adjacent to CQ elements are companion cells. I think these, this fill in the bank is a lifesaver just companion because cells have been written for you so yeah this is easy okay let's read the hard one now now they are saying in question 6 age the last question here not that difficult just a little bit tricky it says that the source of mineral ions for the plant is in the soil solution this is transported from the roots in the xylem so mineral ions usually in the xylem so, but it can also be found in the phloem sap. Why? Why are they found in the phloem sieve tubes when they are usually from inside them? Instead, how are they transported within phloem sieve tubes? Now, my guess for this is that because the translocation process also requires water, right? 
uh, the loading of sucrose into the sieve tube would decrease the water potential near source of the sieve tube near source. So we are already talking about the whole um, whole idea about water moving in. So this is the companion cell, this is the sieve tube, this is the xylem vessel, this is the companion cell, right? The water going like phew, down, back in, back out. What we want to talk about is these parts in within the sieve tubes right here. So because it lowers the water potential of sieve tube near source, so water and mineral ions, again the point here is mineral ions. Mineral ions are carried in water, right? So Water and mineral ions move in from the xylem into the sieve tube, right? And you can say this is by osmosis. Usually osmosis would score you a mark too, just by writing the term. Maybe it's a separate mark, maybe it's the same mark, I'm sure. Uh, you can also write how it this this movement of water creates a steep hydrostatic pressure gradient and this causes uh, the water to move down the hydrostatic pressure gradient to sink so you can say it creates a steep or it just moves down the hydrostatic pressure gradient so water moves water and mineral ions don't forget mineral ions move towards sink near sink see if you near sink you know what i mean right And then, because uh, sucrose is removed, by facilitated diffusion or by diffusion, uh, therefore, water moves back. In water and mineral ions, oh my gosh, because it's about mineral ions, right? Move back. into Zion. And that's it. That would be my answer for this question. If it's okay if I write about not steep, right? You write you wrote down the hydrostatic pressure gradient, sure. As long as hydrostatic pressure gradient is somewhere there. Again, these are all guesses, right? They are all guesses. I'm just guessing based on my experience of the past years, of, of analyzing them, of making notes, of teaching, right? These are all guesses of what they are. Is this paper tough? Yes. But is it very tough? No. Okay, things, they have a lot of words, they try and make it fancy, but the conceptual knowledge is there and it's not that far out. It is tough because they always say suggest why they give you new scenarios but these are these questions are more and more prevalent in in the paper now there's also another thing you can take comfort in if you found this very tough and you found that your answers don't match this paper number one why are you still watching and number two well don't worry so much because if it's a tough paper the threshold will be lower because they will have to match this up with paper 21 which apparently was very easy i do not have access to some papers though because again i'm a teacher at an exam center and this is how i got this paper this is scan this is a scan paper um so yeah i don't have a lot of variants i only have the variant where i work at that's all and why 
why write this why discuss this why because it's fun okay it's fun and also i can figure out okay these are the parts we are examining in paper two maybe okay this is not a prediction most likely they would like kind of balance it out in paper one so if i were you i would go and label um some of these in some of these kind of questions by chapter and i would also um, figure out what didn't come out as much like i realized one of the big parts that did not appear is enzymes and traditionally mcq has many enzyme questions as well so like i would expect like paper one to have a lot of enzyme questions relating to factors um, temperature, pH, concentrated substrate, and enzyme, things like that. Uh, I would also expect uh, some mitosis questions. But again, every chapter is going to come out. Okay, Every chapter. These are already main MCQ questions that come out every year. But maybe the, you know, the emphasis will be slightly different. Like the cardiac cycle didn't appear in the in this paper as well so maybe that would be a point of emphasis in the mcq again i say maybe because i don't know okay i don't know and it's very hard to predict cambridge they change it up every year bio papers get harder and harder every year um and and honestly you have 130 marks in your as all chapters will come out and they know which chapters you skipped they know what subtopics are often neglected by students and usually they would come out come out questions for those topics to remind you to study every single subtopic and not spot questions um i think those are the big ones oh replication and translation uh and transcription translation that has not come out a lot here so maybe it'd be a point of focus but again let's just study everything okay mcq and paper three paper one paper three do well you'll be okay paper one is just a lot of past years and after a while all the tricks are the same and paper three if you know the rules you will do well it's just a bunch of rules yeah so I'm so sorry if I haven't been able to respond to every single chat and comment down here. Uh, but if you have any questions, you can always feel free to Insta message me or email me. Um, my email is biology at gmail.com. Um, I don't know how to make this, this available to you, but I probably would upload it to the Z Notes Discord, which I've been kind of um observing at um if you want so i'll make it available at zenotes discord join them they are amazing peer support is um great there and if you're looking for friends online to help you solve questions together that is a good place to be as well uh, i don't work for them they don't pay me i just really like what they're doing if yeah so yeah um join the discord i'll pro probably post the discord link somewhere so that you can join. I will see you soon in the next video. I hope this was helpful. Let me know if it's not. Tell me your feedback.